Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joanne Knowlton Gabriel. On behalf of the Darien Library, we welcome you to our program this afternoon, New York His National Historic Sites and the History They Tell with Alan Depre. Alan returns for part six of this eight part series to talk about Ellis Island and immigration in the later 19th century. From 1892 to 1922, Ellis Island was the processing location for over 12 million immigrants. Alan will discuss how this process was accomplished and talk about how immigrants were sent back and how fair this process was. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library Campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this possible and our collections available to the community. Our presenter this afternoon has been a seasoned lecturer of programs about our national parks and historic locales for over 20 years, focusing on important issues of universal and American values. A retired United States park ranger, he has delivered speeches to American and international audiences about famous sites such as Ellis Island and Statue of Liberty, Grant's Tomb, and Federal Hall, to name a few. Please welcome Alan Depre. Good, after, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and uh, I, as was said, this is part six. I didn't realize that we had gotten that far, as a matter of fact, but there's only two more after this. Uh, Ellis Island. Uh, uh, Ellis Island got its name from one of the owners in the past. So it had several names, and we'll see some of them as we go along. Uh, Latter part of the 19th century, we're getting into the modern age, really, a lot of new technology, a lot of um, uh, new ways of doing things. And one of the uh, situations was, how do you process the immigrants coming? And uh, New York City was one of the ports of entry, the, the biggest, and the most people went through. Uh, when the uh, uh, immigration process was basically done by the states, we had, of course, Gas Castle Garden, which we talked about, uh, I believe it was last time. A and, uh, and it was decided, and you'll see some of the reasons as we go along, that the federal government should take over the process, which is really uh, uh, one of their enumerated rights uh, uh, they talk about naturalization in the Constitution, and, the, and it's up to the federal government to set the rules and regulations, but that could be easily interpreted to really control immigration as well, who comes and who does not. So we're, le we're going from a more lenient system controlled by the state states to one that had some restrictions. It's a controversial subject at times because some people say they were too much. Others say not enough, and others, uh, there shouldn't be any, have been any at all. But you'll see that some of the uh, reasons uh, why people felt they, that they did, perhaps they took it to an extreme, uh, is uh, what Ellis Island was all about. And the government really balanced, the federal government actually balanced the concerns of the citizens already here and those coming into the country. But we'll start with, and this doesn't seem to want to move, so let me go up here. Alan, right now, um, you, I'm seeing you and not the PowerPoint. Really? Okay, let me go up here again. It says, it says the share is working, uh, so I don't know what's going on. Uh, you are screen sharing, so I wonder why it's not showing it. Okay, why don't you continue and I'll see if I can um, find it on another computer and make sure that okay. it's for everybody else. Uh, uh, so here is a view of Ellis Island, probably uh, in the early, not probably, but in the early 1900s, perhaps as 1907. That was the peak year of the, the immigrants passing through Ellis Island coming to the United States. Uh, one of the things about the process is that uh, how unfair or fair was it? And uh, I will give you a percentage of that as we go along, but you, uh, you might, think, you might uh, think about it and come up with a number of yourself, yourself of how many people actually were allowed to come in and how many people were sent back. That may be the final judgment on how fair it was uh, in the whole situation. 
So there we go. Uh, one of the uh, boats that uh, uh, brought the immigrants from the uh, big ocean liners, the ships themselves, uh, to Ellis Island. Of course, I put the Statue of Liberty in here because that is uh, part of the whole story. And the next picture, I believe, will show you why. Uh, you're coming into the harbor. You see the Statue of Liberty, uh, Ellis Island behind it. And also, we're looking from Ellis Island to the Statue of Liberty. So that was always there because uh, uh, Ellis Island, uh, as a processing center for, the immig for immigration, came after the building of the Statue of Liberty. And that was to become associated the Statue of Liberty with Ellis Island itself. Uh, something to inspire people coming here for economic opportunity, refuge to escape the draft in their own countries, poverty, etc. All of those things were involved. It was called Oyster Island. Uh, uh, I believe that comes from the Indian name for it. Uh, I don't know what the Indian term was, but this would have been in the 16th century, long, long before uh, it became an immigration center, processing center. Colonial period, names for it were Little Oyster Island, Bucking Island, uh, and then there were several owners at well, as well, one of them being uh, 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 an Ellis. Now, in the early 1800s, and I, we talked about Castle Clinton and all, and all the forts, and Fort Gibson uh, on Ellis Island, and you can see how small the island was, was one of those forts that were protecting the harbor in case of a British invasion. So you see a model of it to the left, and to the right, you see the remnants of the uh, walls, and that section is on Ellis Island today. On the outside, you can walk by and look down into that area uh, of where the fort, one of the remnants of the fort's wall. Now, on the left is the original Ellis Island station. I believe it was made of Georgia pine and uh, it uh, opened in 17, pardon me, 1892. And it burned down in April, I believe, of 1897. So it was uh, not a safe structure. Uh, I, I'm told that Georgia pine uh, burns very easily, and obviously it did. Uh, so on the right is the, uh, the structure that was built and uh, Actually, it got an award uh, for from the, uh, the Paris Exposition of 1901. I think it won first prize in, uh, for architecture. So it was quite a, an interesting building. Now, here's uh, the old Ellis Island. And below the to the right, I'm, I question this picture. It said when I looked it up that this was uh, putting out the fire for Ellis Island. It looks like a totally different situation uh, from another place. But anyway, it might have looked like that uh, uh, when uh, it burned down. Here is the new structure being built. Now, New Year's Day 1892 was when the original structure opened. So let's not get confused. Original uh, structure is on the upper left. And when it opened, and long before the fire, uh, the first immigrant to get off the boat uh, was uh, this young lady, and, and uh, Annie, Annie Moore. And uh, she was given a $10 gold piece as she came down the gangplank. Uh, the story goes that uh, there was a German gentleman who was getting ahead of her, and the sailor said, held him back and said, ladies first. So she came first. Uh, she uh, she got that ten dollars, and I guess that's part of the uh, the myth that people felt that the uh, streets of America were paved in gold. That was just almost a a uh, shall we say advertising gimmick, uh, and also a, a sign of good luck. Interestingly enough, she married a German American when she uh, 
was admitted to the country. He worked at the Fulton Fish Market. She had at least 10 children and uh, she spent her entire life on the Lower East Side and died at 50. Uh, there was some confusion about uh, what really happened to her and uh, uh, she was confused with someone else when people did some research and they thought that uh, they thought she was another Annie Moore that actually was killed in a train accident uh, on, uh, in Texas. And uh, when they honored her later on uh, uh, with the statue, et cetera, uh, until they found out <laughs> what really happened, uh, I believe some uh, descendants of her from Texas came uh, to be honored there. So I guess they eventually got that straightened out. Uh, this statue is in the museum of Ellis Island today. Another view, I do like pictures of Ellis Island. It's quite an impressive building. And uh, it was a busy place. And here we go again with more boats that would have been filled with immigrants getting off there uh, uh, and uh, getting ready to be processed at, uh, uh, in, in, this, in the uh, immigration uh, processing in Ellis Island itself. Now this is a view of the full extent of the island. Uh, you see the large structure, that's the upper upper one there, and you recognize it. And then there was an, a second island added for hospitals and a third. At this time here, you see that there was actually some kind of a channel with water, et cetera, in the middle there. Eventually that was gonna be all filled in. And a lot of the, the landfill came from the building of the subways in Manhattan in 1904 and around that, that time frame. So uh, now let's uh, talk about its main function. Ellis Island's main function was to screen out those considered undesirable. And uh, you look at the list, incurably ill, impoverished, disabled, criminals, and all others barred by the immigration laws of the United States. That's pretty harsh. The bottom line, and remember, this was the early part of the 20th century, latter part of the 19th, early part of the 20th century. The bottom line was that you were, you would be, if when you were admitted, you would be able to work and you would not be a public charge. You would not be a charity case that had to be supported. There wasn't much of a safety net at the time. So if you couldn't uh, support yourself, uh, if you had some condition, then uh, you would not be allowed to enter. You were sent back. I believe if you were over 12, you had to go by yourself. If you were under 12, uh, an adult had to go with you. Uh, so very harsh. You look at that and you say, that's terrible. And according to our standards, uh, it is uh, of today, most of our, of our standards. Anyway, so that's something to remember as we go along with this. Uh, before I talk about the, the peak years and how many came through, uh, you have to remember that uh, uh, it was controversial immigration. It had changed uh, in the 19th century, latter part of the 19th century. Before that, through much of the time when Castle Clinton, uh, Castle Garden was the uh, main processing uh, and controlled by the states and not the federal government. Uh, mostly Northern Europeans. Latter, latter part of the 19th century, you were getting Southern Europeans, uh, Eastern Europeans, Jews, Italians, uh, Catholics, uh, and uh, most of the immigration had been uh, Northern Europe, as I say, and most of that was Protestant. So there was resistance. Of course, the Irish that were the first large mass of Catholics coming to the United States. Uh, so there's a lot of discrimination and feeling against them. Uh, labor that was here in the United States and uh, feared that um, uh, the big industrialists and factory owners, etc., cetera, uh, would send agents to Europe to get uh, immigrants that would be get a lower wages and become strike breakers. So there was a law that was passed that said you could not be a contract laborer and come to the United States. 
So that was done for that as well. And then there were the same things. Oh, disease, uh, there were several epidemics at the time and uh, immigrants were blamed, though they got uh, obviously these diseases as well. Uh, but uh, let's see about how many came through. Between 1880 and 1924, 26 million people entered the country. Uh, zeroing in on Ellis Island, it was 12 million. Uh, two two percent of those 12 million, about 200,000 were to be sent back from Ellis Island. So uh, you, it's uh, according to the statistics, it was uh, perhaps not the most pleasant process going through Ellis Island, but the vast majority were able to make it. Having this process to, uh, as I said, it would, it would be a balancing act of letting as many people in as were possible according to the desires of the, United, of the people of the United States and the government and, uh, and uh, who could not come and what the public would accept. So it pretty much was an open door in many ways and the process uh, I believe shows that. Looking at the Statue of Liberty in, uh, on one of the, uh, the boats. Uh, remember that this was the age also of international travel, big ocean liners and immigrants going to South America, Australia, uh, and we, the United States was part of that movement. And the big uh, steamships, remember, if we even talk about the Titanic, uh, there was a lot of people in steerage, immigrants coming to the United States. Uh, so uh, the steamboats or the big liners, uh, the big boats and the not, some not so big boats, but the average, I believe, for the larger ones was they made a profit of $50,000 just one trip bringing uh, immigrants over. Uh, so uh, that was lucrative at the time, a large amount of money. All right, so here we go. It was just at the Ellis Island. And uh, this was April 17th, 1907. Almost 12,000 people came through that day. So this was the day of the highest volume. And I also believe 1907 was the peak year uh, of those coming through Ellis Island. This is the baggage room. That's the first room you would come into through the main entrance. See people waiting in line, getting off the boat. And uh, uh, this is what you would see when you go into Ellis Island today. Uh, a, uh, an example of how the room would look piled high with the luggage that had to be inspected, et cetera. Uh, to make sure there was uh, nothing being smuggled in that shouldn't be, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is probably, I believe this is a famous picture by Augustus uh, Sherman and uh, Italian immigrants. Now this is the second floor, this is the Great Hall. And these uh, folks are waiting to get a hearing or, or not get a hearing, but go up to the official that uh, you had to answer questions, uh, uh, what you did, were you ever uh, convicted of a crime, etc. cetera, uh, were you an anarchist? And these questions got a little more, uh, at, were added to over the years, but they were worried this time. And if, if you know the history of the United States, there was labor unrest. There was a great coal strike uh, in, uh, in the early part of the Teddy Roosevelt administration. Uh, and uh, there were anarchists, or that's what the middle class of the United States feared. Uh, starting back with the Paris Commune of 1870, uh, when the so-called radicals, uh, after the Franco-Prussian War, uh, rebelled against the new French government and was put down violently. So that frightened a lot of middle-class people in the United States that all of these communists and anarchists were going to be coming here. So this again, would be a way to uh, restrict that. 
and also satisfy people's uh, desire that some kind of restriction was in place to protect the country from those who were revolutionaries, etc. Now, registry room itself. To the left, that's what these people are waiting for to go up before uh, one of the uh, inspectors and uh, answer the questions they asked. Uh, and uh, some are what I just said. Uh, they wanted to know, all, it was also written down even before you got to the United States by the, the ship you traveled on, the, uh, uh, the company that ran the liner that you came over on uh, from your uh, country. A and uh, they were sort of, they were responsible. If you, if you, they had to keep somebody uh, if the officials here at Ellis Island felt that you uh, were someone who not need to be looked in further, uh, the steamship companies had to pay for it. Uh, so uh, they were supposed to, shall we say, uh, wean out people, uh, find out who shouldn't be going or not that wouldn't be accepted in the country. And of course, obviously, that wasn't a scientific process. So some people were obviously going to be going to be stopped and sent back. Also remember that there were hospitals on the second island there uh, in that middle island. And, and uh, so if you had a, dis a curable disease, then uh, you were at the hospital. Uh, usually you were detained for a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, once you were uh, healthy again, then you went back to the process, answering those questions, et cetera, uh, from the inspectors. And uh, most likely you would be able to uh, come into the United States. You would not be sent back. So uh, you had to be able to support yourself. That was the idea at the time. And uh, there were certain things, certain conditions that uh, would imply that you couldn't do it. Uh, and I, I use as an example, if you were a seamstress and uh, you uh, were, had a crutch and you had difficulty maneuvering and walking, but your, uh, your profession or your job was being a seamstress, you could sit down, you didn't need to be walking around. So uh, most likely you would be able to stay in the United States because it didn't affect your ability to make a living. Uh, some might ask, well, what if you couldn't get a job as a seamstress? But I, 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 it, it, was, uh, it was if you could not work. That was the bottom line in all of who could come in and who would come not, uh, come, not come in. And also those other conditions I made as the 20th century moved on, anarchists, communists, criminals, etc., cetera, uh, were not uh, desired. Uh, one of the immigrants as well. Uh, now this is Sherman again. He was a head clerk, I believe, uh, at Ellis Island. And uh, he also photographed many of the immigrants coming in. And uh, a lot, many times he would have them have, take them those photographs in their native costume. So I think I have a couple of, of those here. Uh, this is another... Uh, probably Italian immigrant as well. Quite a nice picture, as you can see, almost a, a Madonna and child almost, uh, uh, and very, very nicely done. Uh, now, uh, these are people who were detained uh, that were kept there as well. Uh, uh, you could buy a meal that cost a dollar and the process of Ellis Island uh, took between three and five hours. And then you were on your way if you were admitted. So if you were hungry, you could buy uh, a, a luncheon uh, and uh, for a dollar. Uh, but if you were had to stay, then uh, you did not. You were fed by the uh, government of the United States. Again, this probably is around 1914. The Great Hall as it looks today. Uh, on the upper floor, the third one where you see the balconies, there were dorms there uh, uh, for uh, those that uh, had to stay over. 
that was basically, if you were not ill, that basically was for some of the other issues on, from which you didn't pass. If there was some question of, of you not being desirable because of some of those other conditions I named. There was a big deal about uh, ladies that were unaccompanied. It was implied that uh, they made they uh, made their profession, uh, at, which was considered very undesirable. Uh, so some of these regulations were loosened up and tightened as time went on. If you if you had a sponsor, etc., then of course it made the process much easier. And if you were accompanied with a husband, uh, that also helped as well. Uh, more of the processing. Uh, the gentleman up front looks like he's checking for trachoma, and that is uh, a disease of the eye, and uh, you could go blind with that. And if you had that, you were sent back. Uh, so that was one of the criteria. Uh, they considered that uh, going blind, and I also believe that they thought that you could die from that as well. So you couldn't be cured, so you would be sent back. And here are some children being examined and checked out. Now, as you came into the building uh, and went up the steps to the second floor, you were watched by doctors. And if they thought that you had a condition, they'd pull you aside and you needed to be checked further. Supposedly, the doctors could rec recognize 60 different diseases by just using their eyes and not having to make any kind of test. So if they questioned that, then you were pulled out sent to a holding area and, and the process of uh, further examination would continue. Here we go, same process of checking the eyes again. Uh, and they used a, 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 a tool that you used for the high button shoes to lace them up, to pull the laces up through. That's the, the, uh, the medical uh, uh, tool that they did use to check the eyes. Uh, and of course, here's more of the further process. Men being checked out again, that seems to be a big deal. But as you see, they've had to take their shirts off to be checked, the chest, et cetera, and all other things as well. Now, this gentleman, Dr. Carl Ramos, was one of the chief surgeons. Uh, he was at Ellis Island uh, for many years. And uh, he was one of the doctors, obviously, that uh, was checking out the and giving an examination to those that had uh, were set aside for reason that's mentioned. Now, this is interesting. Uh, some people might make a guess on this or know about it. The doctors used chalk. And if they thought you had a condition to be checked out, uh, this is some of the symbols they use. Uh, uh, X, you didn't want to uh, have that put on your suspected mental defect. Uh, you, we don't use these terms today, but doctors did in the 19th and early 20th. Ins insanity was used uh, as a condition. Uh, uh, physicians, I believe, don't say you're insane anymore. So I know that got some visitors to Ellis Island upset when uh, I used to give the, some of the tours there, uh, a big, but we've got to remember that they're using some of the terminology. And there's the trachoma, uh, the eye disease. I don't think that's uh, a threat at all anymore. Uh, so senility would be another one you uh, didn't want to have uh, written on your uh, clothing. So, that's telling you that this is what they thought your problem was and you had to be checked out further. So you were taken aside and go through a medical examination. Oh, he's back again. Oh, I want him. Uh, around uh, 1915, et cetera, they started using aptitude tests. Dr. Knox's visual comparison test. And you see the gentleman is taking that test with the uh, with probably uh, a doctor. I don't know if it was a psychologist, if they used them at, at that time, and one of the uh, officials of the United States and that test to check his mental capabilities. 
And if you, for whatever reason, uh, which was not medical, uh, that you were a suspect of uh, being a contract laborer or an anarchist uh, and uh, maybe had a criminal record. Now, all of this was pretty much done verbally. You didn't have a paper uh, that the uh, steamship company that, you, that took you over here, uh, you didn't have papers or legal papers with you from the country you came from uh, that, uh, that would uh, say you had a criminal record. So how they investigated some of these things uh, is open to question, but this is the process that was done you're seeing probably what you see on the right is most likely after World War I. And World War I was to uh, re be a big restriction on immigration just because of the war itself, conscription of, uh, of the males fighting the war and also uh, the submarines uh, uh, battles uh, which was a big problem, like the Lusitania, which uh, was to eventually draw us into the war. So that limited immigration to a large extent. Okay, now, through America's big exhibit, that's the hearing room, which we just saw. It looks around it did, like it did in 1911. About 10% uh, of the persons coming through Ellis Island were held for a legal hearing. Uh, and here are the conditions again, liable to become public charges, suspected of being contract laborer, uh, uh, received a yellow cards marked SI, which meant that uh, you would have to go before this board of, a board of special inquiry. Three boards were usually in session all day during the busy seasons. They added a fourth, sometimes a fifth perhaps. Each board held 50 to 100 hearings daily in the presence of an interpreter and a stenographer. Uh, let's see, so each board bases decision on the testimony of the immigrant and friends or relatives who were allowed to speak on their behalf. If you got an unfavorable decision and they were going to send you back, you could appeal directly to Washington. And uh, they actually, uh, you actually could get a lawyer by, from some of the immigrant societies at the time. And approximately 15 to 20% of the aliens who appeared before the boards were ultimately denied admission to the United States. So those who appeared, uh, still, that was in the minority. Don't, uh, we don't want to confuse that with the uh, 2% that from the general population coming through uh, of immigrants who were sent back. And there's an interesting aside uh, on the, that, which I, uh, had done research on when I was at Ellis Island. Uh, and it's not mentioned in some of the research I did now, but there was a way around uh, if you were sent back and if your relatives here or even in the country you came from wanted to help out, say if you were uh, over 12 and you had a condition, and uh, what could happen is that the family could get together, even with many of the poor wages at the time, and uh, get enough money so that you could be, come to back to the United States as a second class uh, a, a person instead of being in steerage. First, second class, steerage, third class. And I believe, I could, I could look at that again, but I remember the amount of money, it was about $40 to go by second class in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, because uh, when you stopped at uh, the, uh, the uh, off of Staten Island and the uh, officials came across to check for diseases and any other problems, it was not the second class and first class people didn't have to go through that. If there was an epidemic of something, it would become obvious. And so they would have to be checked out too. But generally, first and second class uh, passengers were not, did not stop at Ellis Island and have to go through the process. The idea was that if you could afford a second class uh, ticket, uh, you were financially well off enough to take care of yourself. Uh, so 
that there was a way around uh, being after you were sent back to come back into the country. Uh, I find that very interesting. All right, and here we go on Ellis Island looking towards the Statue of Liberty. And it looks like these guys were ready to be on their way. I believe this is a regular dining room where you, uh, if you paid your dollar, you could have a meal uh, if you were not being, or not one of those people who had to, uh, had to wait at Ellis Island until you were checked out by the Board of Inquiry. If you had a medical condition, I don't think you, you would, uh, uh, be sitting in a, in a cafeteria anyway, but this, these are people who probably paid their dollar. Baggage room, remember the room I showed you with the present with all the baggage in it? Well, here they are uh, getting the baggage off the boats, the heavy stuff. Uh, these tags on the uh, immigrants actually were done, I believe, uh, at, on the, uh, the passenger ship. And that had your general information on there and to show that you were going to be going to Ellis Island to go through the processing. And uh, so that, could, that was checked off. And this would tell the uh, officials that you were to go on the boat uh, that would be taking you to Ellis Island. All right, and here we go uh, with some of the reasons. You would be asked 29 questions, not always. As time went by, as I said, uh, uh, towards the, in the teens uh, of, of the early 20th century, when they were worried more and more about uh, anarchists and communists, et cetera, you were asked these 29 questions. Any legal documents, uh, you'd have to take them out. So that tells me this is a little further along in the process because before that you, you wouldn't have these legal documents uh, or they would have come from the steamship company they, itself after they asked you all their own, all these questions. Have you committed any crime, your social class? Interesting enough, they'd ask you who the president of the United States was. <laughs> if you answer yes to any of these questions, uh, you are more likely to be detained, except for who is the current president. You wouldn't be answering yes. Uh, if they decide that your medical conditions should be re-examined, we've gone through that uh, as well, uh, and legal papers, and uh, you could be held up for 14 days while things were being reviewed. It says only 2% of immigrants had to go through this. Well, that's 2% the two, that's two who were sent back. So it was a little more than that going through the process and, uh, and by going through that process of uh, becoming a detainee, uh, only about 10%, uh, 20% of those were found uh, that they uh, could not enter the United States. Two to, and so it's 2% altogether for the general population coming through of those who return. Now, this is the stairs of separation. Once uh, you had gone through all the processing, uh, the stairs in the center uh, were for the detainees. So they would be going on those stairs. Right side, if you were already going through the process, you were allowed to stay in the country, you were going down the steps to meet uh, uh, those that, uh, your, your relatives or a family who were waiting for you, if you uh, had people here already. Uh, and if uh, you would go down one of those left or right. Now, right side, you were going west or south. So that meant you were entering the country to go beyond the Eastern seaboard. Uh, you were going Midwest, far west, et cetera, and to the south. And the left side of the staircase, you would be staying in New York or going north to New England, et cetera. And so here we have one of the dorms for those who had to stay, and that's for the legal uh, uh, for legal reasons because they were concerned about uh, whether you were one of those groups that were considered undesirable. It wasn't a medical condition, obviously. And then here is the hospital, uh, where if you had a disease uh, that could be cured, this is where you went. 
And looks like these guys may be all set as well at this point and ready to leave to go into the United States. Uh, here's the money exchange. Uh, so that's a good thing. So you can have your lira uh, or francs uh, or uh, rubles uh, turned into American money. There was also a good office to, uh, to, uh, to buy uh, train tickets to enter uh, where you and to go in your final destination. These are some of the uh, officers there. And it was interesting about uh, some of the credentials they needed to have to do this. And the Park Service in the museum picks out William Goldberger and he was a interpreter. Uh, so they, these were the guys who were translating for the immigrants who did not speak English. So they needed to know one or more foreign languages. They had to understand some of the common dialects in a given language. Uh, he had to uh, get the words out correctly uh, on what they were saying and make sure the immigrant understood what uh, they were telling them. Uh, it, uh, it was quite a demanding job. Now, many immigrants and many uh, of the interpreters were immigrants themselves. Interesting to know. And here are some of the common languages spoken at Ellis Island. And you had to take a federal civil service examination that uh, rated how you did in these, the language or one of them that wasn't English. And the common languages included Italian, Polish, Ukrainian, Slovak, German, Yiddish, French, Greek, Hungarian, Russian, Ukrainian, Serbo-Croatian, Romanian, Swedish, Portuguese, Bulgarian, Czech, Spanish, uh, Armenian, uh, Arabic, Dutch, Norwegian, and Chinese. <laughs> so they had uh, quite a few uh, uh, interpreters there uh, who knew, knew one or more of these languages. Uh, this guy, Antonia Fabra, Fabra Esilius from uh, Greece, uh, he had quite a, uh, quite a bunch of credentials. He knew modern languages, including Turkish, Russian, Armenian, Arabic, and Spanish, French, and English. <laughs> he studied Greek and Latin at the University of Naples and Athens. Uh, he emigrated to the United States in 1889, uh, and uh, he was wanting to learn more languages and their dialects. When he was naturalized in 1906, he became an interpreter of Greek at Ellis Island. Uh, if you read further on this, he also got involved in finding out one of the uh, uh, criminals that the uh, police were looking for uh, that was trying to enter the country. And he was able to do this by in, uh, interpreting a letter uh, that uh, was uh, damaging to that person. Uh, and he was put on the, the, in the group of those people who were not be allowed to enter. Now, up there, uh, interpreters at Ellis Island, 1908, up there where they, you can see that arrow, the dark arrow, black arrow, and it's pointing to Fiorello LaGuardia, who was an interpreter for, I believe, three years at Ellis Island. His uh, father was Italian, his mother was Jewish. He's an interesting character. There he is. It's his, his, at his desk. And there, this is a three years, 1907 to 1910, 1910. And he, uh, knew he knew Italian because of his background, German, Yiddish, and also Croatian. So that's where his uh, Jewish background came in as well for the Yiddish. Uh, and this is interesting because when he was running uh, for a, 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 congress, a Congress seat in 1922, uh, the Jewish uh, opponent, uh, the uh, uh, other candidate was also Jewish and he accused him of being an anti-Semite. And so uh, LaGuardia uh, could have disclosed that his, his mother was Jewish, uh, but he didn't, he didn't wanna do that. But he dictated an open letter in Yiddish and print had, it was printed in Yiddish and he challenged his uh, competitor, 
to debate him in Yiddish. Well, the other Jewish fellow didn't know Yiddish, so he couldn't speak the language, couldn't do it, and he lost the election. So that's pretty good. And here is when he was, I don't know if he was elected mayor, probably at the time. Uh, I've heard quite a few stories about him because my mother was a big fan of his as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here is the uh, hospital, Dr. Kimmel. Uh, here's an operation being done uh, at Ellis Island. And uh, so here we go. So this is the treatment you would get if uh, you were sick. And hopefully uh, you would be getting an operation if you didn't need one. Nurses, uh, and they were held by the public health service. And I also believe the doctors the same. Uh, they... Uh, were gen in the general hospital wars and wards and the contagious disease wards. T 1913, more than 25 nurses employed in the hospital and wards, uh, and they worked under the doctor's supervision as well. Here's a couple of the nurses, and this is all from the museum, the National Park Service at Ellis Island, and Jenny. Uh, and uh, with a with a young patient, that's the lady to the right with the uh, patient on the stoop there, uh, at circa 1920. And then we have Nurse Colligan, and she was the daughter of Irish immigrants. She worked at Ellis Island from 1900 to the 1920s. Was known as Mother, a kind-hearted woman, and uh, she spent most of her time at Ellis Island. And you had to live there. You had to return at night if you went anywhere, if it was your day off. Uh, so uh, later on, she became she came, became a nurse at the United States Veterans Hospital in, in Franklin County, New York. Uh, let's see. 1918, some more nurses. And here it's just what I just said. Uh, they were assigned at separate quarters. I didn't say that. There were male and female nurses. But according to regulations, all nurses visiting New York or New Jersey during their off-duty hours were required to return to Ellis Island no later than the 12 a.m. staff vote. Uh, one of the nurses or an aide taking care of a baby here, giving him a bath. Uh, there were uh, immigrant societies in the United States and they had uh, volunteers at Ellis Island. And so uh, the one on the left is Foxley, is her last name. And uh, sometimes these uh, volunteers uh, were dressed in native costume. And then to the right, uh, we have a Red Cross representative, and she's uh, giving some pastries out and beverages. So they were there as well to help out, make the oncoming immigrants feel welcome. Here's a, uh, some of the clerks, uh, which uh, they had to make uh, check all the steamship fan manifests, which had the uh, information about uh, the immigrants that they had given verbally. And then as time went on, you needed le more legal, legal documents. And uh, they uh, had to file away all these things, keep them in order. The stenographers, often were at the hearings and they were taking down the necessary information as well. So for the boards of inquiry. So this was uh, probably in the 1920s right here. And this is Augustus Sherman. And he's the gentleman who took so many of these uh, photographs of individual immigrants. And uh, he worked at Ellis Island, he was the chief clerk and was there for many years. And uh, he uh, was involved in also the appeals that were made by immigrants who were detained. And uh, he did that as well. Uh, he, his book, his photographs are quite famous and have been put in a book. I think he also published it during his lifetime with many of uh, these very nice pictures of the incoming immigrants. This is one of them, an English Jewish family, six children. 
photographed outside uh, uh, the building on Ellis Island. Uh, a very nice picture, uh, not demeaning in any way, a nice family coming through Ellis Island. Here are some more of them, an Asian woman, an Asian, the restricting, the restriction, restricted, restriction acts of the latter part of the 19th century and even the early part of the 20th century. Most Chinese were not allowed into the country. Almost all of them were sent back. Uh, a sad story there. And uh, on my right here is uh, a Bavarian miner dressed in traditional costume. Oh, excuse me, I'm back here. Lady from Guadeloupe, West, first French West Indies, 1911. This is a plan of Ellis Island today. On the left, there's the uh, hospital wings. These, those two, those that two islands which were brought together with more landfill, as you see, <coughs> were where the hospitals were. Uh, I believe they're still doing hard hat tours from uh, Ellis Island, the, uh, the, and you can uh, sign up for that. It might be done ahead of time. I'm not quite sure how they're doing it now, uh, but I was long gone from there. I was working at the Manhattan sites <laughs> when they started doing that. Uh, so a tour can be arranged, and they're done quite often. There is a schedule for them, and you have to wear a hard hat to go through some of these buildings uh, in the two islands that were added later on. There's a nice view of uh, Ellis Island, most likely at the present time. <clears throat> that bridge is the way you get from Liberty, you get to the island from Liberty State Park. That's not for the general public, uh, but that's the way the staff gets there. If they're coming from Jersey. If they're not, then uh, they have to take the boat from Manhattan. More processing going on. Ladies either have completed uh, uh, their, it looks like they're on the roof. So that's telling me that these were detained, these ladies. And uh, here we have some uh, people coming through. Ellis Island again, I think you saw that picture. There's a three. There's three models. I think it's on the uh, third floor uh, of uh, Ellis Island. Uh, this is its full extent in uh, after ni 1918 or so. Again, another view of the Great Hall and waiting for processing, and a very nice uh, picture looking towards Manhattan. Closer view of some of uh, the immigrants being interviewed. And again, looks like they're waiting for the boat to get to Manhattan. Here we go again, waiting outdoors on Ellis Island. Oh, I'm doing that. And again, uh, now, we've already said that its main function was to screen out those considered undesirable. And again, talks about how the main, the majority of immigrants, well over, uh, what, what, a large percentage got through, and uh, which was over the, the years from 1892 to 1924, uh, only 200,000 people out of 12 million were sent back. And uh, we talked about the busiest years, but it was 1907, it doesn't mention that here, but uh, the wing containing the legal hearing rooms has been recreated as it looked uh, in the period from 1918 to 1924. Hospital just across the way from that inlet where the ferry boats come in, uh, that was built in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, the courtyard in the back, uh, how much this has been, uh, shall we say, restored, I'm not sure. But a lot of it looked like this when I was there uh, around uh, 2011. Okay. okay, you'll notice the inspection. The port of departure came from Danzig, name of the ship, name of immigrant, date of departure. And it looks like it was stamped uh, first that he uh, got through Danzig, uh, but when he got here, he was sent to the hospital. 
So he was one of those who had to be, who were kept behind. Whether he made it eventually or not, uh, we don't know. Anyway, here are some of the uh, immigration laws. And, uh, and one of the enumerated pow uh, powers, the power of Congress to establish a uniform rule of naturalization throughout the United States. So it's Congress. Uh, if they pass a law, of course, the president has to sign it and the courts have to say it's okay. Uh, that uh, it tells you how you become a naturalized citizen of the United States. I looked, uh, I don't think there's anyone any that says specifically that, uh, that the process has to go through the federal government, but that's how it's been interpreted. Uh, the 14th Amendment, which came after the Civil War, uh, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States of the state wherein they reside. You can't uh, enforce a law that abridges the privileges and immunity of citizens. And uh, you cannot deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And uh, anyone under the jurisdiction of the United States is subject to equal protect protection. So uh, many interpret that as well as those immigrants who are just coming into the country. Uh, and of course, we have the preamble to the United States. Uh, which uh, is one of the ideals or it lists some of the ideals of this constitution and what it wants, it wants to uh, emphasize. And that is, of course, is to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility and provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That's the ideals. Here's some of the uh, laws, immigration laws. The uh, one in 1791 passed on March 26. Uh, once you were here and had two years residency, and this included white, white aliens, as they called them, uh, uh, you would apply for naturalization and be considered a citizen. <laughs> uh, this did not, uh, I would include white women and, and the children, uh, but it, obviously if you were, uh, from Africa, uh, I guess you could, uh, uh, might some of, they might uh, also restrict uh, if interpreted as perhaps uh, you were not from, from, from a desirable area of the world as well. Uh, so January 29, 1795, early years of the Republic, free white aliens of good moral character, a five-year residency is required. So it went from two years to five years with one year in state in the state that they're applying from and uh let's see they uh, the intention to become a citizen uh, uh has to be filed two years ahead of time and so it goes on to a few more restrictions and the one we're interested in uh is may 5th 1892 well that's that's the chinese restriction law so excuse me uh, but when it was turned over to the federal government, just before March 1891, this was passed. Office of Superintendent of Immigration. Classes of persons denied or somebody went over with. Insane, paupers, persons with contagious diseases, persons, persons convicted of felonies and misdemeanors uh, and moral badness. It's a turpitude. means the same thing. And polygamists. They were singled out. Be, and so there you go. And then the Chinese Exclusion Acts were very restrictive, very racist, and all Chinese immigrants had been uh, excluded from the United States for 10 years. And uh, you couldn't, if you were a Chinese la a laborer, uh, your right to come here was an indefinitely suspended, very restrictive for those coming from Asia. Now, Immigration Act, federal control over immigration and policies from states enacted March 3rd. We've already talked about that. And uh, Congress has assigned the responsibility for enforcing immigration policy by the federal government and to make sure it's run more smoothly and to increase its effectiveness. And uh, they added more to the list of the, uh, of the those people who were to be excluded. 
and there was a office of superintendent of immigration and uh, he was in charge of all of this. Immigration Act of 1924, after World War I, pardon the, pardon, the, pardon the spelling of system, I put an extra Y in there, uh, the quota system was started. After World War I, World War I had restricted immigration, basically because of the war itself and the difficulty of getting here and the desire for the Europeans to make sure they had their manpower. Uh, so uh, uh, overall immigration was 150,000 a year. And, uh, but immigration in the Western ha hemisphere was, uh, was not capped uh, to keep, to help good relations with South America and Central America by the United States. Now, instead of just coming and doing all this processing, the only two processing from the steamship companies and from the country you were getting on the boat and, and uh, once you got to Ellis Island, now, you would apply for visas at the United States consulate or the embassy closest to where you were living in the country you were coming from. And there they were interviewed and, that, and applications of that evaluated. So that's the first uh, restrict, restriction you would go through. They would begin to decide there whether you were desirable to come to the United States or not. Uh, and, uh, also, the amount allowed from individual uh, countries was uh, a percentage of that group of people, say of the, uh, the Italians, uh, there were 3 million or whatever. So the quote, your quota would be based on uh, after, oh, the general amount of all the people that were allowed, 150,000, uh, how, how many were allowed to come from Italy would be based on this quota, what percentage was here in the country already, rather complicated. But it showed you how uh, from Afghanistan, 100 people, if you look at this table, uh, would have been allowed by uh, per year. And uh, Austria, 1,413, let's see what Italy says, uh, 5,802. And uh, Asia, of course, very much restricted. And uh, so there you go. So it was not based, it was not a fair system at all. Uh, the fair, a fair system would be, you could cap it, but uh, everybody, every country would be given the same percentage uh, as, uh, to and who would be allowed to come here and not restricted uh, to minuscule amounts compared to the others. I put in Isidore Duncan, uh, she married a young Russian poet. Now, this was the time uh, after World War I. I'm sure most have heard of the Palmer Raids and looking for anarchists and communists, et cetera, after World War I. So uh, remember, communism had taken over Russia, scared a lot of people in the United States. So they didn't want any, quote, bad people coming here who were going to throw bombs and, uh, and make trouble. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to take it too lightly because of the things that have happened in the present time, but a lot of it, it wasn't based on reality, uh, and uh, it, it it was almost a panic, uh, and that did not happen in, at the present time for the most part. After 1924. Uh, this is what, uh, because Im immigration to Ellis Island went down quite a bit. Uh, still, some people came through, but not on the large amounts. And that's what scared people after World War I, or those who wanted to restrict immigration, because the same amount of large numbers were coming after the war. Poverty, destruction from the war, uh, all the things uh, that uh, would entice people or, or would uh, want people to leave uh, was what uh, was feared that uh, there would be uh, would be there would be an overwhelming amount of immigrants. So at the time they were going to restrict it. Uh, but anyway, the Coast Guard uh, used uh, the hospital complex, and uh, there was a school on Ellis Island in world during World War II. Uh, so that was another one of the uses after the peak of immigration at the, from the, after World War I that had been restricted. 
Uh, now you had World War II coming along, so detained German aliens and Italian ones, etc., were often kept on Ellis Island. Uh, and so it became basically a prison for those folks. And uh, so here you go with a, it says a German alien at, uh, at uh, uh, trying, getting some information or checked out there. And it says cooking uh, uh, area. And I think that's on the bottom. And this is how some of the de detainees uh, lived when they weren't in the barracks. And also, before I go into that, uh, during World War I, it, the hospital on Ellis Island had been used for wounded soldiers. I'm not quite sure if that was done during World War II. Now, after the, after the war, of course, we had the, uh, the Cold War, et cetera, and uh, that restricted immigration. And uh, as part of uh, reform under the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson, uh, they, uh, the, the quota system ended. So, as I was saying, uh, they weren't treated equally on how many were allowed to come. So, no, uh, more than 7% of all permanent visas given out in one year, uh, that's it, no more than that. So, everybody did 7% as the limit. And uh, the visas now you could get for family unification. So, if you had someone here and you wanted to join them, uh, uh, it, it was easier to do. Uh, so the uh, after 1965 into the present time, the majority of permanent visas uh, went to extended family members who were joining their families here. Uh, as long as they fell under the 7% nationality rule. So they might get pri priority in that 7% group that was allowed from the country they were coming from. So it wasn't open-ended at all. Uh, these are some items from the museum, an inspector's hat, edge, a uh, dinner plate used in the food concession. So uh, there you go, rather fancy. Uh, cash register used at Ellis Island by the concessioners. Uh, one of the tables uh, that the inspectors interviewed uh, the immigrants from. Uh, now, 1954, uh, every, uh, the hospital had been closed a couple of years before, uh, no longer used for detainees from the Cold War or enemy agents or whatever. And so it was just abandoned. And this is what happened as years went by. So the whole thing was left to rot, basically. So when the idea of opening this as a museum and a national, a national historic site or monument, uh, uh, then they started fixing up, oops, they keep on doing that, I apologize. They started restoring it. And here's the work going on in the Great Hall. It was to open, I believe, 2000, was it? No, wait a minute, let's say down over here. But the date, well, it might have been 2001. Uh, so this is part of the restoration going on. Uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes these immigrants. Uh, and obviously the one, the lady in the center did not dress like that <laughs> when she came to Ellis Island. I believe she was four or five years old from Paris, France. Uh, you might recognize her. And the uh, gentleman on the left, uh, I don't know. Someone might want to make a guess uh, who that is. I don't know if I should say who it is uh, or just let you uh, try to remember these folks and uh, guess who, at least we have the lady in the center as an adult. The gentleman on the left, uh, uh, it's more difficult to recognize. I think he had a little turned up nose at the end and he sort of had a smile that even was recognized uh, if you compared him as an adult with the, uh, the expression on his face, you might see the similarities. And the ones on the right, uh, unless you were a member of my family, you wouldn't 
uh, know who these guys were, but that's my grandfather and grandmother, Sicilians, who came in 1914. Uh, so I, I stuck that in there. And uh, this is the Regina d'Italia book that brought them over in 1914. When I looked up my records from Ellis Island, uh, my grandfather, Giuseppe Catulli, is on the is on the ship's manifest, but not my grandmother. So I know they came together, at least that's what I was told. So that must have been lost or some kind of oversight uh, got mixed up and whatever, but she's not on that list of passengers. Uh, let's see, two famous Americans, Chef Boyardee, and who is this guy? I think that's Irving Berlin. And he came, uh, I believe it was in the 1890s as a child. Tom Carvel, he came in 1911. Uh, some children uh, sitting there being photographed. That might have been by Augustus Sherman. Uh, this is the islands uh, being taken care of by a Park Service uh, employee. Uh, and again, the, to uh, restore these is a long, slow process. There you go again. And that, I believe, is one of the hard hat tours down there at the end, off in the distance. Uh, these talk about how many buildings that were here. Here's the hospital again. 1911, 15 buildings on the islands were devoted to medical care. Laboratories, x-ray plants, psychiatric ward, morgue, uh, bed, a 275-bed hospital, and a 450-bed contagious disease ward. If you had a contagious disease and you were cured, uh, that would not, that would, uh, just because you had the disease and now you no longer had it, that meant that you still were liable to reapply and most likely enter the United States. Uh, let's see, throughout the years, Ellis Island was used as an immigration center. When it was used as an immigration center, over 300,000, 3,000, excuse me, 500 people died and over 355 babies were born on the island. So I don't know about the statistics about those who died uh, from being ill or, or be in, on the island, but it was quite a large number as you can see, but that is over a, let's see, 30 year period. And uh, one of the wards as it looked after was abandoned and uh, on the left when it was still in use. That is the staircase we talked about uh, and, and who went up and who went down. And we have I don't, not quite sure. This does, I don't think this is, this might, this is a part of the dormitories, perhaps. Ships manifest. And here are some, it shows you the deterioration of the hospital area on Ellis Island. And there you go. That staircase is in the main building. This is another hospital ward. They're, they're very interesting pictures and how the, uh, building on here were allowed to deteriorate uh, in the uh, latter part of the 20th century. This is the museum today with some of the exhibits. Uh, also, uh, these are clothing of the period of immigration, some personal letters, uh, uh, objects, uh, ch children's toys, uh, 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 what what the immigrants were wearing, et cetera, clothing, of course. And on the right is uh, the baggage room. Uh, a family passport, baggage room again, and a view of the Great Hall today. One of the dormitory wings for those who had to stay until they, uh, the problem was solved on why they couldn't enter. Uh, this is of course the uh, dining room and powerhouse. Gentlemen looking off into the distance. I think that's Governor's Island to the right and to the left is Manhattan. Another exhibit, exhibit of the peoples, came, different peoples that came to America. And this is, 
the is Liberty State Park and the railroad station there. Those that were going west would have come from Ellis Island, got off here and caught the trains that were going to Jersey, into Jersey, Pennsylvania, the Ohio, et cetera. And I believe that's it. Is there any questions? If I can answer them, I'll do my best. Hello, did am I <laughs> have I kept on going and everybody left me? <laughs> sorry about that. No, That's no, no. All right. I I did go over, I can see. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. I I usually just press my space bar. It didn't work this time. But one question was um were the interpreters well paid? That I, I haven't looked into. Again, I will look into that. I don't remember uh when I, because uh, let's see, I was doing these tours and stuff for 10, over 10 years ago. Uh, so that's something I'll look into and I can report next week. It's an interesting question. <laughs> Any others? And the, uh, the only other question is, um, um, how, how highly regarded were the doctors and nurses at Ellis Island? Was it something that, um, was it a coveted job, that kind of thing? Well, they, some of them went on to uh, uh, work in, in other hospitals that were uh, 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 run by the federal government, or, and, they, and some of them went on to higher positions. Uh, so uh, I, I believe these were uh, pretty substantially trained doctors who knew what they were doing. I didn't mean to scare anybody by the 3,500 that might have been died in the hospital, but we're talking about a different time and uh, modern medicine uh, didn't reach the great heights that it did today, but it was on the way. So that's another thing I could look into as well. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I hope I didn't confuse anybody on the on the immigration uh, a business. And uh, uh, sometimes people get upset about some of the harsh terms used, and uh, and uh, it sounds. Uh, perhaps more demanding than it was. But if you were an immigrant and you came say into the great hall and could hear all these people speaking different languages, uh, you could be very confused and, and it would be hard to perhaps explain certain things to you. But that's what the interpreters were there for. So that was a service, a po very positive service, though they did have to follow the regulations uh, of their job, so. Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending this afternoon's program event and stay tuned for next week, which I think we're doing the Statue of Liberty. Is yes. That right? yep. mm -hmm. yes, we are. Okay, so next week, Statue of Liberty. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.